Geoscientists Without Borders is part of the Society of Exploration Geophysicists. They give grants for humanitarian projects using applied geophysics to benefit people and the environment. They currently have several international projects in progress around the world. After the devastating tsunami hit without warning in 2004, the SEG decided they had to take action to help predict and warn populations in the event of natural disasters. As the program developed, they discovered an expanded potential for the use of geoscience in other humanitarian projects. We determined that there would be three main uh, aspects to the program. Uh, number one, it had to do with uh, doing humanitarian work in the world. It needed to involve our science. The third thing is it had to involve students in a significant way. Then I took it to the CEO of Schlumberger with no hesitation. He said, yeah, let's do it. And so Schlumberger put up um, a million dollar grant to start the program. Following this example, several corporations joined to support the program financially. My name's Susan Webb and I work here at the University of Witzwatersrand and I'm a senior lecturer here and I've been here since 1994. I've now got a project with SEG on the Geoscientists Without Borders project and it's a project at the Dayspring Children's Village which is an orphanage about 60 kilometers away from Johannesburg and they've got a water problem. The water every year in August at the end of the dry season tends to dry up in their main borehole that are in the area. At the school, there's about 100 people all together. There's about 80 students and 20 staff members. It's not quite an orphanage. It's for children at risk. So the children come from difficult family situations. This is the main borehole at Day Spring School, and it provides most of the water to the school for drinking water. The problem is in about August it runs out and then the school has to shut down because there's no water for any of the kids. This is one of the eucalyptus trees that's used in some of the mines in South Africa and they're used in stacks of wood to keep the bottom and the top of the mining area apart. But the problem is they've been planted all over South Africa and they soak up a lot of water. Each tree takes a lot of water out of the ground every day and we think this may be contributing to the depletion of the groundwater here at Dayspring. The Working for Water program in Johannesburg has cleared out a large number of trees from the waterways and that has resulted in the surface water coming back. Here we want to do the same kind of experiment with the groundwater and see if removing the trees helps the groundwater recover. This, this is an example of one of the smaller trees that's been chopped up for firewood and this firewood is going to be used here at the Dayspring Children's Village. And one of the goals would be to make a business out of chopping down some of the bigger, bigger trees in the background that can be used for a firewood business. I've been able to involve a large number of students. I currently have about nine graduate students all together, um, three PhDs and six MSCs, and there'll be a number of them coming out to Dayspring at the moment. I've got David Ungobeni, who's finishing off his master's degree, and he did the resistivity work at Dayspring. And then I've got another one, Sally Ann Lee, who's just started with me for her MSc, and she's looking at the four-dimensional gravity. It's the first time a 4D gravity survey has been done in South Africa, and so we're, we're very excited about that aspect. When you travel the world and you see the devastation, you see the poverty, and you see things that you just don't see in America typically, um, you take more interest. We found something that really connected both what I do as a social worker, what Mark does in geoscience. What we do at the earthquake unit is monitor the activities of earthquake, inform the government of these activities, and try to guide steps at preparing persons for these events. We are trying to find a fault line that potentially might be responsible for the 1692 and the 1907 earthquake. And we're trying to see if we can find offsets that we can date and try to understand events like tsunami. Because in both 1692 and 1907, there were reports of tsunami in the Kingston Harbor. We have mapped pretty much this entire harbor. It's about 10 kilometers to the east and from this point it's about another five kilometers to the west. 
Since the study has begun, we have identified new fault lines that was previously unmapped. This research has been very, very helpful for Jamaica. And without this program, we are really lacking in terms of technology and expertise. It provides us with funding that we cannot afford. So the Geoscience Without Borders has you know, created linkages for us. Places like the Champagne has offered us software that we can use in our classroom, in the teaching of geology, in the analysis of data that we have you know, from our fieldwork that will put them in a better position to understand geology, to understand the applications of geology. Whether it's archaeology or information about the earth that can make local communities better, such as why do these landslides start? How can we detect them earlier? How can we set up methodologies to ensure they're avoided in the future? And to actually be able to be involved and use our technology, our people, our processes, our expertise to make a difference there. During the summertime here in Rio, we get much more rain than in the winter. Every year there are floods. In a 24-hour period on the 11th and 12th of January 2011, the local weather service registered more rainfall than what is expected for the entire month for the mountainous region just outside Rio de Janeiro. The rain caused catastrophic landslides. Very specific places that landslide occur because of the, the way the soil is here. 2,960 homes were destroyed. 900 lives were lost. People knew it was going to rain, but nobody knew it was going to be this huge, huge amount of rain. Not only the landslide, but it was the mass movement, bringing stuff down all together like a river and bringing all the houses down. And so most of the population didn't have a chance. We can show that our model will work. The first thing is to get the satellite image, which is going to be the digital elevation model. Now we need to analyze this satellite image. We need specialists to analyze this picture and say the elevation, look at the type of vegetation, look at the type of soil. We are going to input meteorologic data. So the model will have these three things, the satellite image, the in-situ data, and the meteorologic part. That's going to be integrated with the alarm system. So when the model tells there is a 70% chance of this location coming down, then the alarm will come off and the people should leave. The last step of the project is to educate people. And that's one of the main parts of GWB. We are going to go to the communities and educate people and tell them why they have to believe in the alarm when it rings and why our data is more accurate than what the government's giving them right now. I mean, think about the potential. You know, there are, the geoscientists without borders could grow into, uh, you know, medicine some frontiers, journalists without borders. If they can fulfill their whole potential, they can be a Nobel Prize candidate one year. Geophysical technology has helped to eliminate thousands of wasted man hours and environmental damage during archaeological excavations. It has accelerated the process of finding ancient locations and artifacts that tell the story of our shared history. We, we started a project in Amphipolis about two years ago uh, where we conducted geophysical surveys over there. Once we do the interpretation of the data, we give to the archaeologist the exact location of where possible targets may be. So the dig in Mesodakia started about six months ago. The archaeologists took the evidence from the geophysical data and went over there to start digging. Because we have already indicated the depth of the tomb, archaeologists were in a position to dig quite fast of what is supposed to be the tomb of Roxana. Roxana was Alexander the Great's second wife. She was assassinated in 316 BC along with her son Alexander IV, who was the legitimate heir to the Alexandrian Empire. So you can see the lines over there, which means that this tumulus has been digged by an excavator. Otherwise, if we didn't have the results from the geophysical survey, the archaeologists had to dig by hand. And this will take years in order to, to see the foundation of the tomb over here. It's about five to six meters high, 
and it's man-made material. That means that people were bringing material and they used to cover the two floors of the tomb and also the subsurface with this material in order to mask the tomb and to protect it from many invasions. So they were doing that in order the tumulus to look like a natural hill. As the archaeologists followed Alexander's campaign in search of Roxana's tomb, they discovered first century churches in Cyprus. The second part of this project has been conducted in Cyprus. According to historical evidence, we believe that Alexander and his second wife passed through Cyprus. We conducted a geophysical experiment in the village of Ipsonas in order to verify that. So the overall area that we have scanned is about four square miles. After the digs, we have found two early Christianic churches, one here, another one over there, and some tombs over there. And this is the remainings of a very old church. Actually, it's one of the oldest churches that have been found. So this church is dated first century AD, and we know that based on two factors, uh, the style of the church and the basilica, the way that it's being built. These are actually two churches, one inside another. The older church is over there, and the newer church is what is behind me. So what, what I'm standing right now on is actually the basilica of the new church. Uh, what happened is probably because of an earthquake, both churches have been merged into one. By the end of the year, we hope to, to open the tomb and see what's inside there. My personal view is that this is going to be one of the most important findings ever in the Mediterranean. For me, the most enjoyable part of being associated with Geoscientists Without Borders is to meet with the actual students who are doing the programs. It's all about the next generation of, of geophysicists. Our industry is in a battle for the best minds in the world. Why would they choose geophysics? That's the question we want to answer for them. This is a way that I can help apply the tools that I use on a daily basis for humanitarian needs that really matter to us. Our passion for GWB is, is great, um, but we need other people to be passionate too. Geoscientists Without Borders is a program of the Society of Exploration Geophysicists. It is made possible by the support of our founding partners, geoscientists around the world, and the SCG Foundation. To make a donation to the program, or for additional information, visit our website or phone our offices.